Thank you, Dr. Houston. My name is Josh Alfred from the Venue Block, and we did our presentation over the bus boost buggy for Flanders here in Evansville. Now, just to give you an idea of where our presentation is going to go, we're going to start by giving a background about Flanders and what they do, and then move on to our design, <coughs> which we split it up into three different subsystems, being electrical, control, and the physical layout, and then show you documentation on the cost analysis. So Flanders has their corporate headquarters located here in Evansville, Indiana. They were actually founded in 1947 as a two-man motor repair shop. They were formerly known as Flanders Motor Electric Service, but just recently changed their name to Flanders. They have grown to over 850 employees and have one million square feet of facility in North and South America, Australia, and South Africa. And still to this day, they are privately owned and family operated. This is a global picture that shows just how international Flanders really is. Each position represents a field service location or a test center that Flanders owns. So what Flanders actually does is they both manufacture and repair AC and DC motors and generators but they also do the controls, drives, and automation system. The major industries that they serve include surface and underground mining, metals, power generation, and other heavy industries. A little background about the project. Flanders manufactures, as Josh stated, AC and DC motors. And because AC and DC motors they are built differently and performed differently, so therefore it takes a different testing device to test these equipment. And the device to test the DC motor is called the Buck Boost Buggy. This is the picture of the existing Buck Boost Buggy that they have now. And what the Buck Boost Buggy is, it, it is a low voltage, high current, portable testing device. What is its purpose? Flanders uses the Buck Boost Buggy to provide a controllable amount of current to the test motor. They use this current to see where the, they use this current to get the motor parameters, and then they use these parameters to make the appropriate adjustments to the motor to optimize performance. What's the problem? As of right now, not only is there just one Buck Boost Buggy to share between the two Evansville plants, there's just one to share globally. So this one has been around the globe. And this, this one they built over 30 years ago. So when it, if it does happen to fail, the components are hard to find. Uh, a bottleneck uh, happens at the testing phase. It generally takes about an hour, two hours to perform the actual test, but it takes days or days to make the appropriate changes. Uh, and while there's only one, they did not make a blueprint several years ago when they made it, so the rest of Flanders have, don't have an idea how to make another one. And also, the, they made it, the existing one at an old drag line, so most of the components are oversized, which makes it hard to transport. So what Josh and I was needed of us is that we need to modernize the components the properly sized the components so they're not oversized. We need to create a blueprint so the rest of Flanders is able to make their own. We need to make it easy to transport. And a big part of this project was to implement safety. It just takes 0 0.01 amps, amps being a unit of measure of current, just like miles is for length or pounds is for mass. It just takes 0 0.01 amps for it to send an individual into shock. It takes 0 0.1 amps for it to be stable. And with this project, we are possibly dealing with 200 amps. So this is a system diagram of how we broke down the buck boost buggy into its three subsystems, being the controls, electrical, and mechanical design. And we're going to start with the, electri the electrical design. Here is an electrical flow diagram of the major components of the buck boost buggy. And as you can see in the legend, we've broken it down into the ones that run off of 480 volts, which is the solid white line, 
the ones that have the ones that are off of 120 volts, which is the dashed blue line, and then the, the DC current, and the dashed yellow line is the physical connection between the motor and the generator. So we're going to start by talking about the generator, because the generator is the output of the buffer buddy. So it only makes sense to start there and then work our way backwards. So the, the generator, we were given specifications by flanges on what it needed to do. It needed to produce DC current, first of all, and it needed to produce a maximum of plus or minus 200 amps and a maximum of plus or minus 30 volts. Now where these parameters come from is that the largest motor that Flanders test requires this amount of current and voltage. So now we are able to test this largest motor but, and any smaller motors. Uh, this also comes to where the, our design got its name from. When the generator is producing positive current and voltage, it's boosting. And when it's producing negative current and voltage, it's bugging, hence the buck boost buggy. We also needed something to drive the generator, so we used an AC motor. The, speci the specifications for it was it needed to run off of 480 volts, but it also needed to match the shaft height and the speed of the generator. And as you can see in the picture, it's the physical connection between the motor and the generator. Now we need something to power the AC motor. So the incoming 480 volts first comes to a receptacle. And for the receptacle, we chose a spring-loaded, quick-breaking connection. And we did this for safety reasons. If an operator ever <coughs> needed to unplug the buck boost while it was under load, they could because of this quick-breaking connection. It'll, and what this does, it eliminates the risk of an electrical arc to occur that might possibly harm the operator. We also sized the wire to be one odd, which was large enough to carry the full load current of the AC motor based on NEC standards. And NEC is simply the National Electric Code. The voltage then travels into three different components here, being the external fuse disconnect, the motor starter, and the emergency stop. All three of these components were specified based on the horsepower of the AC motor. And since we specified, or we stressed safety in our design, we made our external fuse disconnect be a visible knife disconnect. As you can see on the picture on the left, when the external disconnect is closed or on, all you see inside the clear window is red. Red meaning danger, warning. There is electricity entering the bug boost bug. The picture on the right shows the disconnect open or off. This indicates that, or you, you can physically see the three knives, meaning that there is no power entering the buck boost buggy, meaning the operator can then do maintenance on it. The final component affected by the 480 volts is a transformer. And the reason we use a transformer was because all of our controls and metering devices ran off of 120 volts. So instead of introducing a separate 120 volt outlet, we utilize this transformer to step down the 480 volts to 120 volts. So then the, the, the metering equipment and, and controls can then utilize this 120 volt. We size the transformer by looking at all the components that run off the transformer and adding up their power requirements. In between the generator and the test motor is protection and metering. And this is not only protection for the operator, but also protection of the generator and the test motor and the metering for the operator to know how much current is going into or from the test motor. And just like the bus boost buggy, we further broke this down into, into a burden resistor, a shunt, fuse, and DC contactor. And the metering equipment shown below. And we We'll first start with the burden resistor. A burden resistor to help protect the generator in case of a short circuit. A short circuit is when there is an electrical fault somewhere in the circuitry and huge amounts of current enter the circuit, uh, possibly hurting electrical equipment, uh, damaging the generator especially or the test motor. Uh, the burden resistor is sized from the max voltage and the max amperage of the generator and also its power rating. Burden resistors are designed so it will stand three times the amount of its rated power rating for 10 seconds, giving an ample 
I took a bird resistor, we implemented a shunt. A shunt is a very accurate resistor of low resistance. Low resistance due to that we don't want to uh, impact the circuitry too much. A shunt uh, helps provide a very accurate current reading for the operator. And it's also more cost effective than just putting in an ammeter, ammeter being a device to use to measure current. And we would need a very large ammeter if we just picked it up directly due to the max amperage of being 200 amps. A shunt eliminates this. And after the shunt, we have the fuse and the DC contact. A fuse further helps the generator help protect against a short of the generator and the test motor. Uh, we size the fuse from the maximum amperage of being 200 amps, so any amps above 200, the fuse is going to blow. A DC contactor is essential for not only more safety for the equipment and the operator, but it's also an essential component of the operation. The operator will, when he gets to the test pad, he will start up the generator and start up the test motor while the DC contactor is open, DC, or the test motor has its own powering system. Uh, but when the DC contactor is open, it's up to the operator to match these two voltages before he closes it. So if he has 10 volts and 10 volts and he closes the DC contactor, no current is going to move from, to or from the test motor. Another good way to think about this is in terms of force. If I have 10 pounds of force and 10 pounds of force, put them together, they're going to eliminate each other. So as soon as one exceeds the other, 10 and 5, we're going to have, now have current. This is important because if he closes that contactor without first matching, matching the voltages, he could introduce large amounts of current to test motor, damaging equipment, and possibly creating an arc hurt, hurting the operator. Now we're going to move on to the controls of our design. We utilize four precision meters, two of which monitor the volts just before and just after the DC contactor, just as they explained. One monitors the amps via a shunt that is going into the test motor, so the, the amps being created by the generator. And the last one monitors the amps via the shunt of the output of the field exciter. And the field exciter is simply the, the device that controls the output of the generator. There are also four buttons, two of which stop and start the motor. One is a push-pull emergency stop button, and the last is an emergency stop reset button. There are also three two-way selector switch, one of which controls the buck and the boost of the generator, so either the positive or negative current and volts. One selector switch controls the DC contactor, whether it's on or off, open or closed. And one controls the field exciter, whether it's on or off. Now when designing the wires for these controls, we went with 18 AWG wires, which is big enough to hold the current of the wire. But we made sure these wires were shielded. This shielded wire protects the signal from outside disturbances, disturbances which the generator and the motor might produce. So by using this shielded wire, we get a more accurate reading. This is a picture of the control panel. We did not actually create this, but we used resources within Flanger to design it. But we gave him the specifications. A as you can see, the buttons are on the top left, the selector switches are on the bottom, and on the top right are the digital displays. On, moving on to the mechanical design, again we use sources inside resources inside Flanders for this design show. What was left to Josh and I was to provide the mecha mechanical engineer the specs of the, the weight and torque of the DC generator and the AC motor, and we also told them that it needed to be cranked and forklift accessible and fully enclosed. And as shown in the picture, this is an eye loop that makes it accessible for the crane and the two housing that make it accessible for the forklift. So, how does the bus grease buggy help Flanders optimize performance of the test? Well, 
The black boots buggy performs what is called the black sand test. What Flanders does is they provide current to the test motor, they see where it arcs, they take note of this, and with this note, they make a graph. And an example of a graph is as shown. They will start at a no load motor load case. Motor load is how hard the motor is working. So right here on the y axis, there's no motor load, so the motor is free to spin. They will start, they provide current, see where it arcs via camera, because we do not want the operator close to them when this arcing phenomenon occurs. They'll, they'll plot this point, take, go back to zero, and start to buff the current. They will plot another point go back to zero, and then they'll increase motor load percentage and do the process over again. And as shown, motor load percent can go over 100. This is because when a, or a, a motor is provided for the customer, they may unintentionally go over what is the motor is spe specified at. So when they specify a little low, uh, the customer has a little playroom. They don't know that, the Flanders does. And this will help the motor uh, not get damaged just in case they go over the full spec. And uh, when they first build the, the test motor, or the motor for the customer, uh, the first few couple times they test it might be skewed down, like shown, or skewed upward. What they essentially want is to have two horizontal lines and they want to make it as wide as possible. This will ensure, so now that the motor has all this room to operate. Anytime it's operating in here, it's not arcing. An arc will occur anytime it's outside this box. So maximum area is optimized performance. For our cost analysis, we compared two different prices. The one shown on the left is what it would cost if we bought all these parts and pieces brand new. This came about to be $26,000. But Flanders didn't need to buy all these parts because they had some of them stored in warehouses. So by already having the AC motor, the DC generator, the field exciter, and the shunt, they dropped the price down to $17,000. So by, using, by utilizing what they already own, they save about $9,000. So in conclusion, what Zane and I actually did was we created an ideal blueprint model for the Buck Boost Buggy. This allows the manufacturer of, of this product, which reduces the problem of only having one to share among uh, globally, and it also reduces the chance of it becoming the bottleneck in the testing process. We also made it more mobile through our physical layout. We made it safer and easier to operate through the mechanical design, making it fully enclosed. The electrical design, we implemented the burden resistor and fuse. And the controls, we implemented the, the emergency stop. We also saved money by utilizing what Flanders already owned. So here are just a few people that we want to thank, because this project would not have been possible without their professional input, guidance, and support. Thank you. Questions. Thank you, Josh and Zane. Um, so you said you created a blueprint. So what are the next steps? One of the things about the current model is that it's oversized. Um, did you, it, is, is the one that you made sized to accommodate all of the different DC motors that are, that are being manufactured throughout the world? What, how did you, uh, did you size it to the largest one possible? Is there any accommodations that can be made while it's, depending on what you're testing? Uh, yeah, our, our specification was the 200 amps converter volts, which that was built around the largest DC motor we've ever tested. Now we have the capability to test that large motor and then any smaller motor.
two questions for you. Question one would be, could you explain why you had to use a motor generator set as opposed to a rectifier to get to the DC? Well, a rectifier actually utilizes diodes to make the AC DC. And for our design, we needed to make it regenerative so we could buffer, which means we couldn't make the current flow in the opposite direction of the rectifier. Also, is there a reason why you're using a fuse and not a breaker? The, the, the fuse is within the breaker? No. Well, you have, you have a fuse in your lock diagram of your protection. Why not a breaker that you could just reset? talked about size, how big is the actual uh, uh, bucket booster that you have now and how big is gonna, the one that you're uh, suggesting? Like the actual, like the actual size. size. Let's give them a big hand.